right? All right. Well, first of all, before we get started into the sort of substance, um, I am Don Wright. I'm the founder, and as the slide says, executive director, I'm no longer the executive director. As part of my eventual retirement plan, I trained one of my therapists to take over as executive director, and I basically split that role. I took all the educational uh, activities out of the uh, list of responsibilities for the executive director, created a new role as education coordinator, which is what I am now. And I train our master's and doctoral students. We have interns that come for eight months. We've had students come to us from universities in eight countries. And uh, I also do any kind of educational outreach, this being one of them. I uh, just came back from the Yukon, I mentioned. I was up there for doing a five-day training seminar. Um, I've spoken at conferences across uh, Canada and the U.S. Haven't left the continent yet, but I keep hoping I'll get an invitation to go somewhere. I've consulted with uh, people from New, Ze New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, who are starting programs for male survivors, kind of giving them some ideas about how to go about doing that. And I've had inquiries from uh, France and a couple other places where people have contacted me just to find out about how we did this. And this was the first agency for male survivors in the country. It started in 1989 in Victoria, the Victoria Male Survivors of Sexual Assault Society. And then six months later, I started the Vancouver Society for Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse and started a 13-year commute half a week in each city. I did that for 13 years, had uh, two homes. Sometimes they didn't know where I was until I got up in the morning, looked out the window, and, oh yeah, I'm in Victoria. <laughs> anyway, uh, I stopped doing that. And then 1997, we amalgamated the two agencies and changed the name to the BC Society for Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse, which I think I can move to the next slide. There we are, BC Society for Male Survivors of Sexual Abuse. And I'm going to provide a, a Agency overview. I gave you a little bit of a history. Uh, let's see what the next slide has to say. We really basically we have five divisions: uh, administration, clinical, victim services, educational, and research. The administration uh, division is made up of a volunteer board of directors, because we're a nonprofit society registered charity, and technically the heads of the department. So the executive director, who's the overall uh, manager of the agency, education coordinator, me, taking care of all the educational outreach, and then we have a victim services coordinator that oversees the uh, victim services program. We don't really have uh, much in the way of a research program. We have an anonymous consumer survey that we have our clients fill out once a year, and that's to satisfy the requirement of one of our funders, but we send the, out the uh, summary to our other funders just so that they can see what the anonymous consumer survey says. But right now, that's really the only research that we've done. I'd really like to apply for a formal research grant. We've got a lot of intake data. You know, we've served probably over 12,000 male survivors in the last 30 years. That's a lot of data. So I figure if we take 120 uh, intake forms and do cross-factor uh, cross analysis, we can have a lot of really interesting data. The intake form asks things like, um, who were you abused by? Mother, father, teacher, stranger? Uh, how old when it began? How old when it ended? Uh, of the various offenders that you've listed, how, have any of them been reported, yes or no? Uh, and then we go on to ask, is there alcohol abuse in the family? Is there drug abuse in the family? Is there violence in the family? Because the family dynamic has an impact on how people frame their experience. Are they supported by family? The family say, don't talk about that, shut up, quit lying, get outside before I slap you. You know, all kinds of negative responses, particularly if it's the case of incest. In the case of incest, very often it's the victim that gets ostracized from the family, not the perpetrator. Because the victim dare expose the truth. And they don't want the truth out there. So very often they get slapped down by the family. Um, and I've had clients that have separated themselves completely from family. It's the only way they can survive psychologically and emotionally. So um, the clinical division, really we have two programs. We have individual therapy and we have group therapy. Um, individual therapy, we do some things that are, that are not traditional. The traditional therapy hour is 55 minutes. Our sessions are an hour and a half long. 
And that's because men are used to being emotionally bottled up. So the hour and a half gives men time to open up, let down their guard, do some work on something significant, and then what's really important is to tuck it all back in again so that they can walk out with their vulnerability without their vulnerability showing. Now, I don't think it's comfortable for a woman to walk down the sidewalk after a session feeling kind of teary-eyed, but she doesn't feel like she's failed as a woman because she's emotional. Women are allowed to be emotional. Men are not supposed to be. We're supposed to be tough and in control and in charge at all times, you know. In the face of disaster, you know, we just keep forging on ahead. The stupid Rambo movies where he's bare-chested, you know, he's injured, but he just keeps all machine guns firing, just keeps going on ahead like he's invincible. We're not invincible. Men are human like everybody else. We don't have a hard shell, you know. We don't have quills. We're vulnerable. And it's unhealthy to deny our own vulnerability on our own emotional range. But that's what happens. So the longer session uh, allows men to open up, do some work, and then shut it all down again so that they can leave. We spent, we spent the last 20 minutes trying to really lighten up the conversation, talking about, so what are you going to do the rest of the week? Oh, I'm going to go, go some grocery shopping. I'll talk about diet. Make sure you buy lots of fresh vegetables. Stay away from the junk food. Um, some of you might say, well, I'm going to go for a swim. Well, that's good. It, you know, the good weather, you know. So we really talk about health activities outside the session. So that gets them kind of not thinking about the trauma, but thinking about self-care and, and realizing that recovery is an everyday activity, not something that happens an hour and a half once a week. So that's really an important part of that. Another thing that we do differently, um, a gender-specific sexual assault center, and I'm talking about women's programs, traditionally only hire women, from their board of directors all the way down to their cleaning crew, women. So I asked a head of a women's program one time, well, what if a woman was abused by a woman and doesn't feel comfortable with a female therapist? What then? She can go elsewhere. Very cavalier. Elsewhere being a private practitioner at the minimum of $120 an hour. A lot of people, especially survivors, can't afford that. So in other words, they're out of luck. But I felt right from the beginning that it was important that we have male and female staff because some of our clients are abused by men, some by women, some by both. So a survivor has a right to choose who they feel most comfortable with. And if that runs along gender lines, they have to have that choice. The other reason that I felt it was important to have men and women is because if we're doing our jobs properly, we, we're modeling egalitarian relationships between the genders. And we do. We all treat each other with a great deal of respect. We actually like each other. All of us, we all like each other. And anybody who's having a, a rough session can go into anybody else on staff and debrief. Typically, they come to my door, but if I'm not available, they can talk to anybody. And they will get the support, they'll get the validation. And clients pick up on that. We've had clients that come into our office because it's a sanctuary. They'll sit in the waiting room, they gather themselves, they try to get their center back, and then once they feel like they've got their grounding again, off they go to continue their day. They're not there for an appointment, they're there because it's a sanctuary, because it's a safe environment. And I think that we do a really good job of, of presenting that really egalitarian collection of people that, that are motivated by compassion and care. And um, I had a meeting with the health board one time, they called me in to do a contract assessment. This happens every year. Usually it was just the program manager and I would meet with that person and we'd talk about the contract make any changes if needed. So I showed up at this meeting thinking it would just be the program manager, but it wasn't. It was the contract manager, the program manager, the financial comp comptroller, or whatever his title is, the executive director. I was kind of broadsided, but they did not throw me off my game. They said, well, uh, we're looking at making major cuts. What, what would you do if we had to cut you back by 50% without skipping a beat? I said, well, I go to the median. They said, well, well, yes, but what else would you do? And I said, nothing different. We're not going to abandon my cl our clients. We're not going to cut back on services. If we have to give up our office and uh, pitch a, a tent in Stanley Park, we're going to keep on doing what we do. And I said, besides, you know, my agency is not where you need to cut administrative expenses. I said, every one of you have an assistant. You have clerical staff. You have a receptionist. I don't have a, an assistant. We don't have clerical staff. We don't have a receptionist. 
And in fact, if you come by on certain days, you're going to see me taking out the garbage and vacuuming. Do you take out the garbage? Do you vacuum? They couldn't say anything. Because, of course, they don't. So not only did we not get a cutback, one of the few agencies in Greater Vancouver that didn't get a cutback, we also got a slight increase. 0.5% or something stupid, but at least we went the right direction instead of getting a cutback. Um, they also asked what I paid our therapist. And our therapists start at $30 an hour for their clinical time, which is pretty low for a master's level therapist, and $25 an hour for note taking or writing a report or staff meetings or whatever. And if we ask them to travel somewhere, like go across town to an information fair, then they get $15 an hour for travel time. So I didn't tell them about the occasional increases. Some of them are up to as much as $38 an hour for their clinical time. I didn't mention that. So I said, when they said, well, some of the programs that we contract with agencies will have our own psychologists do it. I said, oh, do you pay your psychologist $30 an hour? Well, of course they don't. They're going to pay them the going rate, probably $120 an hour. So no matter what they came up with, I had a counter argument. They, they didn't win that particular discussion. I won that debate. <laughs> I've gotten really good at that. I kind of know how to play the political game. Uh, and that's why our agency has continued to fl uh, flourish, and we, we grow gradually. Every year, our program gets a little bit bigger. Um, moving on to another aspect about the clinical program, group therapy. Um, we used to run groups just kind of ongoing, and then if somebody dropped out of group, we would bring in somebody new to replace them. And so there was a bit of a rotation. And one time, I said to a group that was down to four members, because we're down to four members, I want to bring some new people in to fill in the, 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 I think six or eight is about ideal. And one of the men said, I've opened my heart to so many men who have come and gone, I just don't want to do that anymore. So I said, okay, I respect that. But I want to say that you guys are really healthy. You've been in group for a long time. I don't think you need this agency. I don't think you need me. This is the time that you come in and you focus on your personal growth, which I'm fine to be part of. But I think you need to recognize how healthy you really are. You have really resolved the majority of your issues. And you've got the tools to continue to resolve issues as they present themselves. So they all went away and thought about that. They came back the next week and they all agreed. And so I think we had maybe two or three more sessions in that group disbanded. Although they had formulated supportive friendships out of that group. So they continued to be connected and to support, support each other outside the agency. So around that time, we decided to set up 12-week group cycles. And that's good in some ways because nobody comes, once we get that group going, nobody new comes in. So for 12 weeks, you've got the same group of guys that meet every week. They formulate the trust, the, comf the familiarity. Uh, they know each other's story. They can be really supportive of each other. Um, and the other thing, too, is that at the beginning of the 12-week cycle, we ask them to identify personal issues that they want to focus on during this 12 weeks. So, for example, if somebody wants to work on, on dealing with anger, well, six weeks in, how well have you progressed in addressing that issue? Have you just scratched the surface, or do you feel like you're moving closer to re resolution? <clears throat> Could be uh, sexuality issues, a lot of uh, gender orientation confusion. Uh, uh, relationship issues, communication issues, uh, self-esteem, self sometimes I can't talk, it's early in the morning, give me a break. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> self-esteem, guilt, shame, all the standard issues that we'll talk about. And so the 12 week gives you a way of measuring your progress during that 12 weeks. Now we don't set limits on how long people are in group therapy, they can do cycle after cycle after cycle. We've had some men that have done two or three years of group pretty continuously, cycle one after another. We have cycles that start in September, January, and April. And then we take a longer break and we'll run into to June maybe, the April, May, June. And then July, August, there's no group because I want to take some time off. I want to do something else. Here I am uh, doing something else. Um, and attendance is going to drop off because they want to get outside. They want to enjoy the summer weather. Um, <coughs> Sometimes somebody will do a couple cycles, take a break, do something else, come back. Once people are uh, a client of the agency, they're, they're never cut off. I've had clients that have 
left and two or three years later they call me up and say can I come in absolutely they don't even have to go back to the waiting list they're on our books they're a client so it's their process and that's another thing that we do that's really different we don't impose any kind of agenda on our clients there was a program in Vancouver that I think it I haven't heard anything of it for a long time I think it shut down it's probably a good thing because they had a series of modules that everybody went through. It's like some kind of college diploma program of some sort. I don't think that honors the unique issues of each individual. And that's what we do. We sit down with an individual and we get our best sense of who they are. Their style, their pace, their personal agenda, their own unique history. And we shape our program to fit the client rather than shaping the client to fit the program. And when you have people that go through a series of modules that are tightly constructed, you're not honoring the specific needs of each client. So that unique attention to the individual is why our program, is, one of the reasons why our program is successful. Because we really meet clients on their level. Some clients are highly emotional and they cry and scream and carry on week after week and you try to get into some kind of analytical work not going to happen. They need to cry and scream for a while. Okay, they do that. Once they, they purge all that grief and, and sorrow and anger that's been built up for sometimes decades, then you can start looking at the belief systems that are a product of the trauma, uh, analyze where those false belief systems have come from. Uh, then you can do that analytical work. Some men start out by being analytical and they can analyze and they can, we can have these great intellectual conversations for weeks, but no emotional content. So then we have to find a way to help them tap into their feelings. But we always start with what their strength is. If it's emotional out, outpouring, great, we're there. If it's analyzing, I can analyze along with them. But once we sort all that out, I mean, I, I, I've got a lot of analogies that I use. One of them is a pressure cooker. Pressure cooker sitting on the stove, the stove's on, the, the pressure's building up. The emotional people open the valve and let the pressure out. But they never figure out where all that heat's coming from. They just keep opening the valve, clamping it back down again. Opening the valve, clamping it back down again. They never figure out where the heat's coming from. The analytical people know that they, it's coming from the stove. So they remove the pressure cooker from the stove, but they never open the valve. So it's still dangerous because the pressure is still in there. You can't just pop the lid off. You're going to have food all over the place. So they have to rem let off the, the valve, remove from the heat. You have to do both of those things. And I'll talk, when I get around to interventions, I'll talk more about some of the ways in which we address that. But really, you know, really building the program to respond to each, each individual is why it's effective, and that's really important. Uh, when I work with students, uh, I have doctors, uh, masters or doctoral interns that work with me, um, we start out individual therapy with, we do intakes with uh, three or four different clients uh, until we get clients that really feel comfortable working with the two of us. And so we'll do our intake, we'll go through all the paperwork, and then we, we explain our experience, what we bring to the table. And then at the end of all that, we ask the client, do you feel like this is going to be a workable, workable arrangement? And if the clients say, yeah, I think I could work with the two of you, then I will work with the student and the client for a few weeks. It used to be that I would work with the client for six weeks, and then the client would have the right to choose which of us they would prefer to continue working with, and the person they don't choose would step out to pick up on new clients. What was happening too often is that the clients were opting to work with me, and then the students weren't getting the hours. So what I do now is I tell the clients, I'll be sitting in for about three sessions and then I'll be stepping out. But it's important that I know enough about your case so that I can provide viable supervision. And the student will be consulting with me on an ongoing basis, so you need to know who they're sharing information with. So that three, two, three, four weeks, whatever, I, it varies depending on the complexity of the client's issues. Um, and then with each student, I try to pick one client where the dyad or the triad works really well. The three of us work really well together. And so we will present that option. I'll say, we both really like working with you. You're uh, such an interesting person. You're so engaged in the process. You're working really hard. So we both really like working with you. So if you like, we will both continue working with you for the duration of the student's practicum, which is eight months. 
And that way, I'm able to work with a, with a student through more of an arc of the client's recovery. I mean, three or four weeks, you're still building trust. You haven't really gotten to the really big, meaty issues. So when I work with um, a client and a student for the full seven and a half, eight months, whatever we can manage, um, then I really, the client, or the student observes my work with clients over different stages of their recovery, and I can observe the student, and when it comes to evaluation, I've actually got something to go on. Uh, some for, uh, organizations, when they have practicum students say, well, here are your cases, your office is down the hall, talk to us later, and there's no observation. And then we're expected to do an evaluation. And I know that some programs just tick all the boxes, oh yeah, it's really good, yeah, great, great, fine, oh yeah, really good, and they don't really know, they just wanna be a nice person, so they give them a good evaluation with no foundation. And that's not good for the client, it's not good for the student. So sitting in on the room with the student gives me an opportunity to really see what they're doing and give them some viable feedback. They also will co-facilitate a 12-week cycle and we, we work together for the entire 12 weeks. Um, and that's really great. Sometimes it's a uh, female and sometimes it's a male. When it's a female, I think there's a great potential for some interesting uh, counter-transference to go on. Because the, the student and I, the female student is mom and I'm dad and the group members are siblings. And so on a subconscious level, people are working out their family issues in that dynamic. When it's two males, eh, we're just a bunch of guys in the room talking about men's issues. It's really, it's really productive either way, but it's a different kind of dynamic when I've got a female student going on. The Victim Services Program, uh, there's probably a description in the brochure, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. The Victim Services Workers are non-clinical staff members. They focus primarily on legal issues. Um, so, for example, if a client is interested in making a police report, they will help set that up. They will contact the appropriate police office. Um, typically, the abuse is supposed to be reported to the precinct in which the abuse took place. But we have clients that come from all over the province and even some that come from the states or other countries. We've had a couple clients from Mexico that have immigrated to Canada. Um, and actually a, a, an Iranian uh, immigrant as well, come to think of it. Um, so where we can, we explore, the victim services workers will explore compensation wherever the person came from. In Canada it's easy because every province and territory I think pretty much has a a criminal injuries program of some sort. Um, but they all provide different kinds of uh, uh, response to victims. I think it's Saskatchewan provides an award for a pain and suffering. And they just give the client an award. Now the client can go off and buy a stereo system, a whole whack of drugs, or they can buy therapy. But there's no follow up. And so a lot of people are gonna put that money into the wrong thing and their life is still chaotic. Whereas in BC, Crime Victim Assistance, they will cover the cost of therapy. But the problem is that the criminal injuries program is for victims of any kind of crime. So if somebody snatched your purse and took off running, that's traumatic, but do you need a year and a half of therapy? Probably not. 24 sessions is probably plenty. Or if somebody vandalized your car or broke into your house, you know, you're not gonna need years of therapy. But when you've been raped by your mother and father from infancy to adolescence on a weekly basis, you're not going to get over it in 24 sessions. You can apply for an extension, but under rare circumstances, we've had an additional 12 sessions. But even at 36 sessions, that's still not enough. So the criminal injuries program is limited in BC. Ontario, it's a well, I'm not exactly sure what it stands for. It's CICB, Criminal Injuries Board of, I don't know what it stands for. I'm not gonna try to guess. Anyway, not only do they not set a limit on the duration of treatment, but they also provide an award for pain and suffering. And we've had clients that have gotten as much as a $12,000 award, and they've covered, you know, 18 months of therapy. And it's almost like no questions asked. They do, uh, they used to send somebody out to Vancouver from Ontario 
who would meet with all the applicants in the greater Vancouver area. And, and they would meet with them in person, and that's how they determine the amount of uh, pain and suffering that they're gonna get, as well as whether or not they fit the criteria to qualify for compensation. But now we do that through Skype, which is really great, saves them a lot of money. They're not shipping somebody out west. And uh, the clients are in a room with their therapist that can provide support, which is really important. So Ontario's really good, and every compensation program that I know about, you can only apply if you um, were abused after the date of enactment of their Criminal Injuries Act. So in BC, the first one was uh, Criminal Injuries Compensation, which was established in July 1972. So as long as you're abused after that enactment date, you can qualify. If it was a month prior, you're out of luck. And Ontario, somebody challenged that, saying there's no statute of limitation on sexual offenses in Canada. There shouldn't be for compensation. And so that limitation was overturned in Ontario. I'm kind of waiting for somebody, I guess it's going to come down to me, to challenge the program in BC. I'll try to get some MP or MLA behind me on that one. Um, because a lot of our clients were, you know, go back to the 50s. And why shouldn't they be entitled to compensation, especially if they were abused in some kind of government facility? But in BC, we have something called the Residential Historical Abuse Program. Now, people, when they hear that, think it's for residential schools. But the residential schools are all federally funded. That's not what that money is for. It's for anyone that lived in any kind of residential facility that was paid for by the provincial government. So foster home, group home, Juvenile Detention Center, Provincial Hospital, those kinds of things. If you're 18 years of age or younger, you're considered to be a ward of the provincial government because your accommodation is being paid for, whether it's foster care or whatever. And I've even had some clients that were adopted by a family that either the family was abusive or they did not take good enough care of the child. Um, I had a client who was adopted by a family. He was the only adopted kid in a family of four children. And they clearly did not care as much about him as they did about their natural children. At 13 years old, he ended up living with some single woman who was sexually abusing him and had a handicapped son that he was sort of taking care of at 13 years old. What parent isn't going to know where their 13-year-old kid is? that he's living with somebody down the street. I mean, it was just, anyway, so I went to the provincial government and I said, you placed him in an unhealthy home where he was being abused and neglected. And they approved. And I've got two clients that were adopted and the abuse took place either in the home or while they were in the home. And because the, the province approved that adoption, they granted coverage. And one client who was up for adoption the one that had the three natural siblings and he was the only one adopted, he's been in therapy for 10 years and that program has covered his therapy. So it's a really good program and it does not require a police report. All you have to do is say, I was in foster care with the Smith family at Fourth and Alma, I'm making up names, there is no Smith family there. Um, and they go into the records, they, uh, yes, in fact, you're in care, great, you're covering. No police report, you don't have to give details, you just say, I was abused while living in this facility. And you're in. So it's really good. Um, we can apply to compensation programs across the province on behalf of our clients. And the victim services workers, they have all the application forms on file, they've helped clients fill them out, they can explain any kind of question that the clients come up with. If they get turned down and want to mount an appeal, then the victim services workers will help them put that appeal together. Um, if they're going to court locally, they will sit in on the trial and provide support. And uh, by sitting in and providing support, you avoid being subpoenaed to testify, which is kind of a, an interesting thing I discovered because I was sitting in with a client during their court trial. And because I was sitting in taking notes, they wouldn't subpoena me because my understanding of the case could have been influenced by what I was hearing. But I've been in therapy with this person for a couple of years. I know all the stories down to the you know, detail. Anyway, that was fine. I didn't get subpoenaed. Uh, the other thing that victim services workers do 
is that if there's any services that the clients need that we don't provide, uh, we've had a number of instances where the clients clearly need some kind of medical care and they're not doing it. They're not taking care of themselves uh, health-wise. So they will get them connected with some kind of health service or dental service or emergency housing or a soup kitchen or anything that we don't provide that the clients need. Now, a few years ago, um, well, up to a few years ago, new clients were always seen by a therapist who would do the initial intake. But if nobody had an opening, it could be a month or six weeks, maybe two months wait period for them to get in. So rather than wait for a therapist to have an opening, I wanted the victim services workers to do an initial intake. So during the initial intake, they find out about all these other services that they might need. And also, uh, <clears throat> so are the victim services workers like full-time salaries? Yes. Yeah, the, we have three big full-time victim services workers. One is split part-time, uh, three days in Vancouver, two days in Surrey. And the other two are full-time in the Vancouver office. The coordinator and one worker are full-time in the Vancouver office. Um, so during the intake, they also find out whether the clients want a, a male therapist or a female therapist if there's a day a week or time of day that works best for them, because a lot of our therapists are part-time. So if they say, well, I'm, the best day for me is Wednesday afternoon, so they know which therapists are working on a Wednesday afternoon, and whether it's male, female, whatever, and they can, they can connect clients with what they deem to be the best match because they know the staff really well. Uh, one client, uh, we did the intake, actually a, a student and I did the intake, and at the end of the intake we said, do you feel like this is going to work for you? And, they, and he said, well, not really. I'd rather work with a gay therapist. So I said, okay, I'll pass your file on to Doug. He's very open. He's married. He has a male partner, um, very open about being gay. And so we transferred the client to him, and it worked really well. It was a very su successful matchup. So the victim services know all of our personalities, where we come from. Uh, we've got uh, two uh, Iranian therapists on staff who speak Farsi. One speaks Dutch, the other one speaks Swedish as well. Um, not that we ever really need that, but sometimes that cultural connection is relevant. But also the Iranian community is very closely connected in Vancouver. So sometimes Iranian clients choose not to work with an Iranian therapist because there might be uh, family connections. Not relative, but their family might know the therapist's family, you know, that kind of thing. It's a small enough community. Um, but the options are there. They also find out where the client lives geographically and which location is going to be best for them. Uh, some clients live in a, a, a location that's really kind of midpoint between Surrey and Vancouver, but then it's a question of how do you travel? Do you drive or do you take public transit? And which uh, location is going to be easiest to get to, even though it's uh, equidistance between the two. So they're able to determine all that stuff. The really beautiful part of that is that a client calls in and they have an intake within a day or two. And so they feel like they're in the program. They're not waiting for six weeks to get in. They're in right away. They may not be face to face with a therapist yet, but there's something underway. They've got that application going. They're getting their housing needs met. The, the victim services workers are helping them arrange medical care or free dental or whatever they need. They feel like some of their needs are being met and then the therapist picks up as soon as they can, depending on openings. And, um, but once the client file is passed to the therapist, then the communication then is directly between the therapist and the client when it comes to setting up appointments and so on. So the victim services uh, program is a really valuable uh, asset. They also fund us, our biggest funder is the victim services program because they pay full time for the three victim services workers, and that's, that's uh, a pay plus benefits. And so we've got a, point, a benefit point of medical, I think they get $100 a year for eyewear, and I think it's 60% of medical and dental, I'm not sure because I decided to opt out on management anyway, so it's different. Um, but because that's our biggest funder, 10% of that money and it's about 140, I think it's 142,000 a year. 10% of that money can be used for overhead costs, rent, office supplies, insurance, whatever. But 
I managed to negotiate coverage through uh, the province's master insurance policy. So our agency is, our insurance, our liability insurance is paid for by the BC provincial government. We used to pay it ourselves, but I negotiated inclusion in that funding for uh, that insurance, so that saved us a whole bunch of money. And the coverage. How many years have you been around when you managed to? Uh, it's only been a couple of years, so over, uh, probably over 25 years that we were paying our own liability yeah, insurance. We still, record. yeah, we still pay 50% of the therapist professional liability insurance because we insist that they have it but most of them have some private practice or some other professional source of income we've got one that teaches a group therapy at, at the Adler school um, so because they have other professional activities we're not paying the whole shot so we split it with them some of the therapists choose not to take advantage of that benefit that's fine we we put that out there but if they don't feel like they want to take advantage of that's okay I'm not going to force them I'm not going to force the money on them if they don't want to take it. Um, the Vancouver, uh, the province of Victor, uh, <clears throat> BC is broken up into five health regions. And we span three of those health regions. Vancouver Coastal Health where is the one where uh, Vancouver office is. They subsidize our clinical program Vancouver only. And they pay about, I'm guessing, around 20 to 25 percent of our therapist wages for Vancouver. We cannot use that money in any of our satellite locations. So the money that supports the, cat, the satellite locations is client paid fees or any donations or fundraising that we can come up with. Now the residential historical abuse program actually pays more because they'll pay for the full hour and a half session. Um, and I forgot what the rate is. I think they pay 95 an hour or something. So for an hour and a half session, I don't do the billing, so I think it works out to $147 or something. We estimate our cost per session if we factor therapist wages, overhead costs, is about $85. So that extra money from that RAP program can be kind of moved sideways and cover some of our other uh, shortfall elsewhere. And they don't care. I mean, the therapy is getting covered that we're contracted to provide. But I think most of our, uh, you know, the educational funds that I bring in, uh, for uh, the Yukon, they paid us $2,000 a day. So that $10,000 check that I bring back to the agency is going to subsidize a lot of our activities, which is really good. I'm trying to get more of these things going on because, first of all, my primary agenda is spread the knowledge. And if it results in some revenue for the agency, well, that's gravy on the, on the mashed potatoes. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the Victim Services Program is quite valuable because it does that initial intake kind of a thing. There's a lot of support. Um, because our Victim Services Coordinator, her office is right next to the waiting room, a lot of people kind of see her as the receptionist. She's by no means a receptionist, but she's right there. Quite often clients will give, if they're paying by credit card, they'll pay her because she's got their credit card reader in her office. That's fine. Um, if um, we have an online room booking system because our rooms are shared by a couple of therapists because they're part-time and students who are there part-time. So we've got this online room booking so she always gives a guided tour for students so that they know how to use the online booking. And if a therapist calls in and said, um, I'm going to have to cancel my client today, can you contact him? So they can contact the client let him know that uh, the therapist isn't going to be in, and then they can change the booking on the online booking. So they kind of do some support things. One of the victim services workers will put together the invoices at the end of the month for the compensated clients, and that's a, a benefit as well. Uh, the educational program, like I say, it's the master's and doctoral student internships. It's this kind of thing. Um, all the media interviews that I do are, are my responsibility. I kind of want the executive director to get involved with that too because I think he needs to be known as the executive director. He needs to be visible in the community. So um, when I can line up some interviews, I'll have him at least come along uh, to be part of that. Uh, we're also in the, we're in the process of producing a documentary. We have a short, um, I think it's about 10, 15 minute documentary called The Cost of Silence. It's sort of an introductory to our big hour long documentary that we're doing on male survivors. 
And the um, short version, which is just interviewing this one 19-year-old victim who was abused by his father, he's very articulate. Um, he's talking about his experience, his recovery, and uh, he was a cutter. He would cut himself. And at one scene, he's riding in a van as he's continuing to talk to the, the whoever's filming this. And he's got his arm sitting on the window of the car. And you can see the scars from the cuts on his arm. At the end of it, he, he's, it goes from him talking to the camera to him sitting at his desk writing out his story. And at the end of it, he rolls up his story, puts it in a bottle, seals it up, and takes it to the ocean and throws it out into the water. And then with the big documentary, the next person being interviewed finds this bottle on the beach, opens it up, reads the story, and starts telling his own. It's, I don't know how, it, we're just kind of in the editing stages right now, so I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I, don't, I haven't seen the storyboard, but I know who's in it, and um, I know the general idea of what's going to be. I'm hoping it'll be out within about six months or something. I'm not sure when. When you're putting together a video, you just don't know how long it's going to take to sort of do all the editing, and you might want to reshoot some of it. And he wanted to bring in some uh, animation at some point, but we haven't been able to raise the funding through crowdfunding to be able to do that. So we're going to have to cut out the animation unless some miraculous uh, donor comes along and said, "Yes, here's some money." You know. So was it all funded by crowdfunding? No, the agency uh, the agency donated ten thousand dollars. My agency, yeah, we donated ten thousand dollars because it supports us, it promotes us, it, it helps us be known. We don't really have the ten thousand dollars to spare, but I really, I said this is, this is promotion. This is going to go to film festivals. It's going to, hopefully, it'll be picked up by Netflix or something like that. So it's going to be good for us in the long run to spread awareness. And. If it generates any revenue, once his expenses are covered, we get the, the, the revenue. If it gets picked up by Netflix and it starts making money, it's going to benefit the agency. So hopefully there'll be a return at some point. It might be a long term, but there will be something coming back to us. But it's, it's so important that it gets done and that it get out there. Um, I've seen a couple other videos that have been produced. Uh, one of them is not very impressive. Um, you know, it raises the awareness that men actually are abused, but it's not really very insightful. It doesn't really probe too deeply into the issues. Um, Sheldon Kennedy, I saw a video of him talking about his experience, and it's, yeah, it's okay. But we're really getting into some really deeper exploration. I'm interviewed in it. Our victim services staff have interviewed. A couple other therapists are. We've got several different clients that are abused. We have a First Nations man that was abused. He doesn't say who his offender was, but it's really obvious that it's his mother and whoever she was seeing at the time. So at one point, I'm sorry, this is going to, I don't even know if I should say this. He was forced to go down on his mother while being sodomized by her boyfriend. And he talks about that. And, you know, that's, it's really powerful when you hear him talking about the, what he went through. And, and the recovery process and how he turned to alcohol as a way of coping. When he said that, I was thinking, oh, that's not a great message. But then he, he talked about that. You know, it was the only thing, it's the only way I knew how to cope. And it helped me manage my life in some way, but I knew that it was a problem. And so eventually I got help from the BC Society. And now I'm clean and sober, and I'm a much healthier person now. And so the transition from the abused boy to the healthy adult, it's all spelled out in, as he's talking to the camera. We had a, I was doing a spring training seminar in our office, um, in our group room, and a man drove all the way from Montana to attend that seminar. Turns out that he was also a survivor, and he's somebody who's trying to get, uh, is it Butte or Missoula? I've forgotten what city he lives in, but He's trying to get something going in his community, and he's really not getting any traction. So I asked him if he wanted to be part of this video, and he said, yeah. <laughs> so he's interviewed, both as a victim who's trying to get some help, but also somebody who's trying to advocate for men in his own community and, and get something going in his community for men. So he's going to be in the video. 
Um, after we produce that and get out there into the world, we want to produce a series of educational DVDs that will be uh, really meant for master's counseling programs anywhere in the world where they teach in English. <laughs> I don't know, maybe we could do a Farsi version. Hmm. <laughs> Farsi subtitles, maybe? I don't know. Um, anyway, that will, that will be, we figured that would be uh, four discs, eight chapters, two chapters on each disc. And it's based on my PowerPoint. So you get to see what's going to be in the video somewhere down the road. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention is the research. We used to apply for a grant for a particular project. We, we applied for money to run the project. But, we never, and, but every funder is asking for an evaluation afterwards. Well, we never asked for money for the evaluation. So we get paid to, to deliver the project, but not paid to do the evaluation. So now when we apply for a grant, we always incorporate funding for an evaluation. It's called administrative overhead. That, cost, that includes planning uh, and evaluation and you know, feedback, whether it's a formative evaluation or a summative evaluation, uh, depending on the project, will go either way. A summative is at the end you evaluate the effectiveness. A formative is that you, you evaluate as the project is moving forward and then you suggest changes to make it more effective and more efficient. Um, but we've never done a formal research project that's just about research. That's something we want to do, um, and that's something we will do eventually. So let's see what comes up next. <clears throat> so under administration, we've got governance. Uh, the board primarily will, do, uh, will work on policy and procedures, hiring and performance reviews, Hiring uh, is really kind of done by me because I work with uh, victims, uh, with the students. And we, other than, well, including me and the executive director, we have 17 therapists working for the agency. All but three started out as students. Then after eight months, I, ho I know who the good people are and I invite them to stay and join the staff. Um, one time, uh, a student had been hired by me. I just said, you, got, you have a job now. And at a board meeting, the chairman of the board said, you know, I don't really feel comfortable bringing somebody on as a staff member without an interview. I said, well, if you think that the eight months I spent with them is not uh, a good enough evaluation, uh, we can do the hour and a half interview if you'd like. And she said, never mind. <laughs> so that was the end of it. So now I'm the one that decides which students get to stay and who moves on because I've got eight months to really see what they're all about. You're not gonna tell in an hour and a half interview, and we've made some big mistakes in those hour and a half interviews. So this is a lot better way. They do interview the victim services worker because we don't have victim services practicum students to choose from. So on the occasion when a position has been vacated, then we will interview new people. But we've actually gotten quite good at interviewing people, and we really trust our intuition. We have a bunch of questions that we ask, but we really rely a lot on our, intuition, our intuitive sense of the person. And when we rely on our intuition, we make the right choice. When we don't listen to our intuition, that's when we made the wrong choice. Because you really get a feel from people by how they present themselves. It's not just the words they say, it's their energy. Um, the board also does a lot of liaison with government funders, but that really comes down largely to the executive director um, because we're the one that work with, the, we meet with the ministry when it comes to the contract review. Uh, we're the ones that meet with the ministry when we're submitting a proposal for, like the, our third victim services worker was only part-time. He was working three days a week in Vancouver so I put together a grant application along with him, he, he and I worked on it together, for a six months pilot project for a two day a week victim services worker for our Surrey location. And naturally we offered him the two days, so now he's five days a week. And I know that we're able to show that that's a viable program that's well needed in that community because Surrey is the fastest growing municipality in BC. And funding is based on a population formula. So it's not going to be a problem to prove that there's a lot of male survivors in that community that need victim services. So even though it's a six months pilot project, I think there's a really good chance it's going to be renewed to be annualized funding. 
and we would if we're in direct contact with the ministry and every couple months there's a, a contractors a service they call it a contract service providers meeting with all the various programs that are funded by the health board all meet together and we talk about the issues what are some of the problems that we're having what are some of the breakthroughs you know how are we addressing these problems and we're the ones that show up for these meetings not the board of directors so we have direct liaison with government funders comes primarily from us however once a year we are expected to submit proposed budget for the coming year the chairman of the board happens to be a public accountant so she does all the proposed budgets for the coming year uh, and sometimes I'll, I'll sit with her after she's put together the budget and I'll say well we need a little bit more money here but we don't need quite as much money there because I know more about the daily operations of, of the agency so with my input, she'll adjust, adjust that budget. We submit that and then that's, that uh, determines how much money we're getting for the coming year. And then at the end of the fiscal year, we have to do a financial summary of what we did with the money they gave us. Again, she does that because she keeps a record of all the expenses. Um, she does the, some of the, most of the therapists are on contract, so they're considered private practitioners on contract. So we don't do any payroll deductions. We just pay them a fee, and they do their own deductions for CPP or Revenue Canada, whatever. That's on them. But the paid staff, that's uh, me, the executive director, and the victim services staff are all considered paid employees. So she calculates the deductions for EI, CPP, uh, Revenue Canada. So she calculates all that stuff, and of course she's got all those records. So she does the year-end financial summary, sends those in. And then the executive director and I have to do the verbal descriptions. Uh, what were the problems that we ran into? What are some of the new is issues that are emerging in the communities? And how have we addressed those problems? So that verbal description of actual program delivery, uh, we work together on that. Uh, I'm still involved because I've done them for many years and he's learning how to do them. So probably after this year, I won't be involved in that. That'll just be on him. Um, and then... Uh, Does anybody actually read those? I don't know. Uh, but they have to be there. They've got a tick box. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been submitted. Yeah, yeah. You get your funding. I think they probably do. But, you know, they also want stats. So the raw stats, the number of clients, the number of sessions provided. That's what they're mostly interested in. They don't really care whether Joe X used to be suicidal and now he's not. They don't really care. We do the anonymous consumer survey that really kind of spells that out. And this survey asks, first of all, um, how would you rate your individual therapist, your group therapist, your victim services worker, and then You've got NA if you don't have one of those. And then it goes from poor to good to very good and excellent. One or two clients rate us as merely good. The majority say that we're very good or excellent. So that's really good. The first time I handed them in, I said, well, I, excuse me, I apologize for not having more responses. I think I had about 30 or something. And they said, well, it would have just been more of the same. That's fine because they were all consistently really high rated. And then there's a series of questions that are also really valuable. If you're doing evaluations, these are some things to keep in mind. What was your life like before you entered into therapy? You get all these things, I was strung out, I was alcoholic, I was suicidal, my relationships never lasted more than a few weeks, I didn't trust anybody, I had no friends, I couldn't hold down a job. Oh, that's a whole list of negative stuff. And how has your life changed? My relationships are a lot healthier now. Um, I'm able to hold down a job. I'm clean and sober. I'm no longer suicidal. So again, a lot of positive outcomes. And then another question is, how would you feel if the agency had to shut down? <clears throat> we get kind of a mixed response. It might be, uh, I think I'd be all right because of the skills that I've learned. But I, I feel for other men that haven't found this agency yet and really need it. So that's a really good statement. Or some clients said, um, I think I'm, I might backslide because I, I only, I've only been in the program a while and I, I really need a lot more help. So that's a really good question. It really shows that 
the program is important and valuable to these clients. It's either had an effect or it's underway. But a lot of clients really, they say that there are a lot of men out there that need this program and to shut this program down would be, a, you know, it would be nearly criminal. So uh, <clears throat> the board and the administrative staff uh, get involved with fundraising. We have this great fundraising <clears throat> activity that goes on every spring, every April. We have a, a music night. One of our board mem members is an actor, musician, uh, singer, like he's an all around talented guy. He actually was on a tour of, um, what was it called? That British film about male uh, strippers. They, they, they wanted to raise some money and so they you had this, you know, this... Anyway, they did a, a, a play version of that that toured around uh, Canada. They, they've probably been around here somewhere. I don't know what it was called. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, he's got connections to the local community. So we got all these incredible musicians, singers, uh, comedians that come in and participate in that evening. <clears throat> And so often people come to that wanting to be supportive of the agency and so many people came up to me after and said, I came here because I wanted to support the agency but I was blown away by the caliber of entertainment. We also have a, a couple large auction items. One was a $500 uh, voucher for CP Rail or Via Rail or something like that. Uh, and that went for about a little over $500. And then there's a dinner for four that's donated by a five-star restaurant in town. And if you win the bid, you and your partner or friend get to have dinner with two director of Bart on the Beach and the executive director, I think it was the Fringe Festival. And so those are your dinner guests, are these two people. Uh, last year it was um, Bernard Cuffling and Nicole Cavendish who are, that are actors in the in uh, Vancouver and then years, this year it was Hiro Kanagawa who's in um, a new TV series that just came out I forgot what it's called sorry can't remember and a female actress I wasn't familiar with them right away but I was a, a familiar of the program this new TV series that that they're the stars of and so you get to sit with dinner with these really interesting people and you've got this great dinner conversation all for whatever you bid on. So that's really good. We used to have a silent auction, but the board decided it was too much trouble with not enough of a return. But, you know, if it brought in $1,000, I'll take it. But they decided to drop that. Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> we just had a, a former client put together a comedy night and he had six comedians that came in and they all had their 10 or 15 minutes. And it was really pretty good. It was, you know, it was only a couple hours, but it raised, it raised 12 or $1,400, I think. Some of that was donations, some was it just, you know, ticket price to get into the comedy night. A couple of years ago, another former client organized a poker night. And we had uh, a couple of Hockey Hall of Famers. We had uh, Johnny Bauer, who I don't know anything about because I don't follow hockey. In fact, I think when I apply for my citizenship, they might turn me down because I'm not interested in hockey. I mean, what kind of a Canadian am I, you know? But my joke about hockey is I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. I don't think, I think it's sport sportsmanship. I, mean, I don't think there's any need for fighting, but people go there for the blood. I don't know, it's kind of twisted from as far as I'm concerned. Anyway. Um, and there was a BC Lions guy there. Uh, Graham Wardle, who's one of the stars of Heartland, he was there. And so one of these people were sitting at a poker table and you would get some kind of a bonus if you were able to knock out the, the celebrity from your table. So if you're able to you know, win the hand and you know, get rid of the celebrity, then you win some kind of prize or something. Um, and that generated $20,000, but it cost us $11,000 to put it together. So we didn't do all that well, all things considered, but we, it was a learning curve. Bringing in Johnny Bauer, we had to pay for his hotel and airfare. So the organizer said, well, 
I know better now. I'll just have a local athlete so we don't have to pay for a hotel and airfare. We might give them some kind of honorarium, but at least we're not going to have that other big expense. Um, and I don't think that you really need to pay honorariums to everybody because some people volunteer. In fact, the comedy night, I know that the guy that organized it, he personally paid the comedians because one of them came up and said, I want to donate my fee. So I'm going to get a hold of the organizer and say, I, I found out that you were paying these people to perform, which I really appreciate, but you shouldn't have to do that. I can give you a, a, tax, a tax deductible receipt for a donation for the money that you gave these people, because he should. You know, it was a donation to the agency by way of paying their fee. So I will give him a tax deduction because we're a registered charity. So we try to do a lot of that kind of thing, advertising, promotion. I just got a, gr a grant for a bus ad campaign. They're, they're up above, you know, you've got these advertisements that are about this long and about this wide up along the, the, up, you know, the length of the bus inside. You can also buy bigger uh, exterior ads, but, you know, the bus goes by and you can barely see what it is and the bus is gone. So the interior bus ads, you're sitting there on the bus for 45 minutes for an hour, you're either staring at the person across from you or you're looking up or you're looking in your phone. So there's lots of time for people to pick up that information. It's really great. I got a, a federal grant for that. It was like $2,400, I think, they gave us. And that buys one month of bus ad placement. But I learned from experience that they don't necessarily take it down at the end of the month. They tend not to take it down unless they've got a new ad to replace it with because advertising sells advertising. So I might get two or three, four months out of paying for one month. So it's a really good investment because they will stay up longer. Um, so I think I've blathered on long enough from this. Let's go to the next one. Okay, I've talked about some of this stuff. I talked about individual therapy, about the sessions being an hour and a half long. We've got male and female therapists. So clients have that choice. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the what the therapeutic process looks like in a, another cell, so I won't talk about that now. Uh, group therapy, uh, I've talked about that, two and a half hours once a week for 12 weeks, on and on. Uh, support for significant others, I haven't talked about that. Um, the family members, you know, the, the partners of, or in some case, the wife of and the adult children of a male survivor met with me. He wasn't there, but he was drinking, he was acting out, he was just really not doing well, but they had no idea how to help him. So his wife and his adult children and their spouses all came in for sort of a family meeting, and I identified some of the issues that were going on in their family dynamics. They owned a business, and it was a kind of, um, kind of a warehouse space of some sort. I'm not really sure what they did exactly. But at the end of the day, the father would open up the cooler and they would all have a beer with the staff. And I said, you're not running a bar, you, you run a warehouse. You're enabling him to get drunk with his staff, which is not really good. And then they're all going to drive home and maybe get in an accident for which you are legally responsible. Stop doing that. They, if they want to drink after, the, after work, they can go down the road to the bar. Stop doing it. That was one of the things I identified. This was a long time ago, so I don't remember all of it, but I identified a couple ways in which they were accommodating or enabling his dysfunctional behavior. And that really helped them change the way they interacted with him. Now, it may not result in him coming for therapy, but at least they're not going to facilitate him acting out in ways that are self-sabotaging. Uh, a lot of partners have come in because there's a lot of behavior that they don't really understand. Like, for example, the non-survivor partner will come up to the survivor and try to be affectionate. And the survivor's like, just leave me alone, you're always at me. Well, they're not really rejecting their partner, the affection is triggering a memory. So they're rejecting the trigger, not the partner, but the partner doesn't know that. So um, I think this is a, I have a case example of how um, well, the first, he, he was involved with two different women, not at the same time, um, while in therapy. The first woman was very aggressive. 
uh, she would be coming on to him and he said, I'm really not in the mood. Oh, come on. She would just keep pushing for it. And ultimately, he ended that relationship. That was a big part of it. The other part of it is that he was abused by his mother and her body type was very much like his mother. And there was that pushing, pushing, pushing for having her needs met, which is what mom did. So the next woman he was involved with, he gave her kind of an abbreviated summary of what he'd gone through. You know, mom abused me and blah, blah, blah. He said, you know, sometimes I just, you know, intimacy can be triggering for me and I just need to not go there. He said, okay, I get it. So she would come up and, and he said, I'm really not in the mood. She said, okay, do you want to talk about it or do you just need, to, do you just need your space? So because she honored and respected his needs and didn't push herself on him, that became a healthy relationship, and as far as I know, they're still together. So because she understood, now he instructed her, rather than her meeting with me, but he was able to explain to her what that was all about, because he had been in therapy quite a while and, and was pretty healthy at that point. But that's what we do with, with clients. We help them learn to understand what their partner is going through and to be able to be responsive in a more functional way. Now, we're not training people to be live-in therapists, but to, to honor the struggles that their partner is going through and then find a way to articulate their own needs as well. Not by being pushy and aggressive, but by saying, well, you know, I'm just trying to give you some affection. If you're not in the mood for it, that's fine. Just, you know, that's cool. Just I'll wait for you to, to, to initiate, and I'm okay with that. So really being able to strike that balance between articulating their own needs and at the same time respecting the process that their survivor is going through. So that's been really helpful. We tried doing a support group for survivors, did it once, but we have a, a hard time finding enough partners at any given time that all want to do a group together. So we haven't managed to do more than maybe one cycle of, of partners groups. But we did do a couples group twice where it's, it turned out that they were all heterosexual couples, just by happenstance, and they all were survivors. Both the men and the women were all survivors. And so here they were all together in a therapy group, and in both cases I felt it was really important that they be co-facilitated with me and a female therapist. So that's what we did, so that the women feel like they are also represented. And it was so amazing because day one we're all in the deep end of the pool, because each person has their, both their nemesis and their number one support person embodied in their partner. So right away, we're right into the depth of everything. Um, there's an exercise that I did using something called O cards. I should have brought them with me, it didn't, so I can only explain it. But there's a perception exercise. The card has, um, there's two sets. There's a large deck. They're O cards, if you're interested, it's OH. And I think they were created in Vancouver so, uh, so, or in Victoria. They're really good therapeutic cards. The large deck has a word on the outside. It could be anxiety on all, all four sides or sexuality or trust or whatever. It's a nice big deck of cards. <clears throat> and then there's a smaller deck that fits in the middle of the big deck. And those are image cards. And it can have all kinds of images. Um, there's a beach scene, there's a, a park scene with a rainbow, and there's a bunch of scenes with people in it. Adults, children, all children, all adults, whatever. So I will take a card that has more than two people in it, and I'll pass it around to the, to the group, and I'll say, write down what you think is going on in this card. If there's eight people in the room, you get probably six different interpretations, and the two that are similar are still going to be different. Uh, but they all see something different on these cards. And then I'll pass around another card with a different picture in it, and this time include the emotional content. What do you think these people are feeling? So then they'll write down what they think is going on in, the, in a different card and what people are feeling. And then I'll pass the third card around, and I said, okay, now I want you to write down what you think is going on in this card, and what you think people are feeling, but I also want you to write down what you think everybody else in the group is going to see. So when it comes to be your turn, I'll, everyone's going to say what we think you're going to see in the card. And then I'm going to ask you afterwards, what's it feel like for you to make assumptions? All these people made assumptions about how you're going to interpret a certain piece of information. How did that feel to you? Well, that person was right on, that person was way off the mark, and I, I didn't feel like that person got me. 
that person did. When I did this with a couples group, a woman in one group and the man in another group got each other. They were completely accurate, but their partners were off the mark. And so they were kind of like, what's this all about? And I said, you interpret your partner through the filter of your experience. Like maybe last night you had this great lovemaking, or maybe you had an argument, or maybe you had a big issue with the kids. But that's the filter through which you interpret their response to that card, where these two people, all they had was a direct observation of how they interpreted the, the first two cards. Oh, okay. So that card is a really good uh, example of how given exactly the same material, the same information, we're all going to perceive it differently. Another example I use, and it's just a verbal example, which I think works really well. Most products in Canada have French and English written on them. So if there was a cereal box sitting between us, I'm going to say this cereal box is all written in English. And you're going to say, no, it's not. It's all written in French. Now, I'm looking at it. It's written in English. And you'll say, I'm looking at it. and It's written in French. But then we turn it around. We realize it's French on one side, English on the other. We're both right. But we're looking at it from a different perspective. And so when people argue, it's usually because they don't understand each other's perspective. And so these are two examples of we help get people to really understand that you have to really listen and understand the other person's perspective. You don't have to agree, but you have to at least see what that is and hear where that's coming from. And with that broader view of whatever the issue is, then your view might change because it incorporates more information and an additional perspective. So the O cards and the serial box analogy are both really good ways to deal with conflict. So whenever there's conflict in a group, I will use one or both of these exercises as a way to help people understand that whole issue. Um, we have a couple times, we have come up with uh, targeted group processes. One of my students who was short of hours needed an additional 12 hours. So I suggested they do a six part, two hour group process focusing on a particular issue. And I don't recall now, but maybe it was anger management or something, but she chose a topic and did a focus group that was focusing on just that topic, six sessions, two hours, that gave her the 12 hours that she was missing. One student developed a, a, a similar workshop on parenting issues for survivors. It never actually got offered, but the design was there at any rate. So that was good. Um, when it talks about team support, what I'm really talking about there is that the victim services worker is helping a client access, excuse me, uh, compensation, uh, or maybe they're preparing to go to trial, or maybe they're preparing a victim impact statement for trial. At the same time, they're also doing individual therapy and they're doing group therapy. Well, all of that's under the same roof. So we can all make sure that we're all working together and in, in heading the same direction with the client. We're not working at cross purposes. Now, if we share information with another person, whether it's a group member or a victim services worker, we only share what's relevant for the other person to understand. So I don't have to get into a lot of clinical details with my clients, with a victim services worker, but I might say the client is going to be moving. So you need to inform the compensation program and Crown Council that this person is going to have a new address at the end of the month. They might not be actively seeing the victim services worker, so they're not going to have that information. Or the victim services worker is going to come to me and say, uh, compensation has gotten a hold of us and they need to know this piece of information. The next time your client is in, can you ask, ask him to sign this form or provide this particular little piece of information? So the communication between the different uh, personnel is going to make sure that that client's needs are addressed. But again, we're really careful about only sharing the information that's relevant. So that works really well, really, really well. And then there is sometimes out referral. And that's typically that's to somebody who's so deep in their addictions that they need to be in a residential treatment facility to really get a handle on that addic addictive behavior pattern. But if we do that, we refer them to a couple different treatment programs that validate the importance of addressing history. There are some programs that if a client says, that I was a victim of sex, oh, oh, don't, oh, we don't talk about that here. Oh, you can't talk about that. 
So the message is it's inappropriate to deal with it. That's not a good message. There are a couple programs that we like and that we refer to because when a client discloses, <coughs> they will say, I think it's really important that you recognize that that's probably the root of your addiction, but we don't deal with that here. But what we recommend is that you contact these people. They'll help you with the trauma. We'll help you with the addiction. So when we do that, usually in, if it's residential, you have to stay in the program for a couple weeks and then you're allowed to get a day pass to go to an appointment to see to meet with your lawyer uh, or to go to your doctor or to go to your trauma therapist. So when they get to the point that they can take get a pass, then they will come to us to do the trauma therapy. But if you think about it, when the substance is leaving your system, everything that the substance was suppressing is going to come floating to the surface. And then it becomes overwhelming. And if you don't know how to deal with it, the only way you know how to manage that overwhelm is to go back to the addiction. So recidivism, hey, I said the word right. I always struggle with that. <laughs> uh, so programs that don't deal with the trauma, there's a lot of recidivism. But the programs where we work concurrently, then there's much less likelihood that the client's going to fall off the wagon. In fact, there is a lot less falling off the wagon when we work with both issues. Now, we're, we understand the role that the addiction plays, but the ways in which an addiction counselor works with a client, is, it's a lot more about pattern behaviors, and I don't really know exactly what they do, but it's more complex than what we do with addictions. We just understand, we identify it as a coping strategy that's getting in the way of making your life work. But you need to replace that with something more functional. So our work is about replacing more functional coping strategies, and then it's easier for them to choose to not drink or drug anymore and to take this new strategy instead. Um, <clears throat> but that comparative, uh, co co interactive uh, process is a lot better. What time is it? Do we should be taking a break or what? 10 past 10. Do we want to take a 10 minute break? Sure. Okay, let's take 10 minutes at this point.